value for money and the Tour de France aren't exactly two things that go hand in hand, and today is no exception. We've got our hands on some of the most expensive bikes that you can possibly buy. So if you're in the market for the ultimate road bike or just like ogling at what the pros are riding, then stick around to see how they compare and which we'd spend our own money on. You might have already seen from our previous videos that my personal pride and joy is an SL7 S-Works Tarmac. This one, in fact. However, over the past few weeks, I've had the chance to ride some of its World Tour competitors. Let's find out if it's made me regret my purchase. Let's start with the Pinarello Dogma F. It is, after all, the bike that Ineos Grenadiers have made famous. And although the Tour de France GC victory looks unlikely this year, Pinarello remains the brand with the most Tour de France wins by quite some distance. The Dogma was also one of the first bikes to truly embrace the aero and lightweight philosophy, combining aerodynamic tube shapes without going so mad that the bike weighs too much to smash up a mountain. Some people like to call this particular version the F14, but officially Pinarello ditched the number suffix when this bike was released in 2021, when it replaced the F12. There's plenty of nods back to Pinarellos of old. For example, the fork still has this on the curve, which is said to reduce longitudinal and lateral shocks. The latest generation also has fully integrated cables, is 9% lighter and a claimed 4.8% less draggy than the F12 that won all those Grand Tours a few years back. Our particular build is very Italian affair with Campagnolo Super Record EPS group set and these very swish Campagnolo Hyperon wheels. Like nearly all the Dogma Fs out there, the finishing kit comes from the company's in-house brand Most. Next up, we have the bike which has a far greater chance of winning the Tour, the Colnago V4 RS, which will of course be piloted by the likes of Tadej Pogacar and Adam Yates. Like Ineos, Team UAE Emirates will have just the one bike at their disposal for the 2023 Tour, which will be used for by both sprinters and mountain goats alike. The V4 RS isn't exactly a brand new bike despite being released last year. Pogaccio was seen seemingly for ages on the prototipo before we discovered that it would indeed be called the V4 RS. Our particular build is a bit of a mashup between the UAE 2022 and 2023 setups with a team colorway, 12-speed Shimano Dura-Ace Di2 group set, as well as Dura-Ace C50 wheels, and then a Data cockpit, bars and stem. Data Superbox, what a name. If we're talking about winning bike races, then there's one bike that surely has to make the cut, the Cervelo S5, the Canadian company's out-and-out -out aero race bike. At last year's Tour de France, it was the most victorious bike in the peloton, picking up three stage wins and plenty more podium finishes. There's plenty to look at on this bike, not just because of the garish green paint job that of course commemorates Wout van Aert's green jersey, this head tube, for example, or the wing-style stem. Savello really has ripped up convention when it came to designing this bike to cheat the wind. Unfortunately, this one here is Wout's actual bike that he rode onto the Champs-Élysées last year, so I'm not allowed to ride it, not even around the block. Happily, however, the local bike shop had one that I was able to get my hands on, and in a scarily similar build with Shimano Di2 and Dura-Ace wheels. At this year's tour, there's a few major differences on the Jumbo Visma bikes when compared to this one. The team has switched to SRAM group sets in an offer that reportedly Shimano simply couldn't match. The wheels have also been switched out with this year's bikes fitted with Reserve Wheels, a sister company to Cervelo. The SL7 has a truly enviable reputation as the lightweight and aero bike to beat. And well, sometimes I do come across as a bit of a specialized fanboy, but this bike really does showcase the potential of the big S when it's not cocking up designs like it did with the Venge Vias. That really was a bike to forget. With the SL7, the compromises in my mind are just right. The cables are semi-integrated and run under the stem, something that has now become far more popular than when the bike was released in 2021. The frame weight can rival that of a pure climbing bike, and well, it's been developed in the in-house wind tunnel, so you'd really hope that it's got decent wind cheating ability. Specialized even claim that this model is faster than Venge's of old. Out of all the bikes here, you could argue that it's this one with the lowest spec, with a now quite dated Shimano Ultegra 11-speed Di2 group set and first-generation Roval Rapide wheels. If you want to check out the rest of my build, including the Megura brake calipers and that, well, that titanium top cap, then you can by clicking the card up above. Let's kick off our comparison with some prices, shall we? 
It's safe to say that if value for money is the aim of the game, then all four of these bikes are some way off making even the long list. The S-Works SL7, despite being over £500 more than when it was released, is in fact the cheapest frame set at £4,500. And as with all the bikes there, you get the proprietary seat post included. The V4 RS is next at £5,000 for the frame set. And unlike on the SL7, you don't get a stem included. So you'll have to account for that as well. The S5 takes another jump up to £5,400, but does come with a set of bars and stem, so likely works out a similar price to the V4 RS, if you're building them up with equally premium components. And finally, the most expensive of the four is the Dogma F, which comes in at £5,500 and, well, scarily few additional extras. I thought I'd have a quick look and see what bikes you currently get for that kind of money. The answer is most. Carbon aero frames, electronic group sets, and carbon deeps can all be had for less than that. And that's before you even start looking at the second hand market. One thing's for sure, if you want the ultimate in the world of bikes, then you'd need to have some really deep pockets. Geometry plays a pretty key role in the way a bike rides. And as you can imagine, with all the bikes being designed for racing, they're aggressive, low slung machines. Here's some of the stats in a size 54 centimeter or medium bike, because, well, that's what I ride. When it comes to reach, the Tarmac and the V4 RS are slightly longer bikes, but with only four millimeters difference between the longest and the shortest, we're not even talking about having to use different stem length. The stack of the bikes throws up some slightly larger differences. Here, the SL7 and the S5 are the lower bikes, and it's not surprising given this very short head tube on the Cervelo. That said, even the Colnago with the biggest stack and head tube is far from an endurance bike. So if you're not looking for that super aero position that can get uncomfortable, then an endurance or less race oriented bike might be the way to go. The extra comfort that they can provide often makes them quicker in the long run anyway. The SL7, S5 and Dogma F all share the head tube angle in the region of 73 degrees, which is fairly typical of a modern race bike designed to combine fast steering with high speed stability. The V4 RS is the outlier here with a slacker fork meaning that the steering feels not quite so quick in favor of descending stability. The seat tube angles are all pretty similar and are designed to put you over the cranks for optimum power transfer. Although you will notice most pro riders switch to a zero degree seat post to put them even further over the cranks. This is most noticeable on the SL7 thanks to its seat post shape. So out of all of them, which feels the most aggressive? Well, the S5 certainly feels bloody nimble with the shortest wheelbase and chain stays. The SL7 is pretty similar, followed by the Dogma F, and then the most relaxed of all four is the V4S, but it's far from an armchair. It is also worth noting that if you're tiny or very tall, then Pinarello might be your best bet with 11 frame sizes ranging from 50 to 62 centimeters. We're being told more and more that weight isn't the be all and end all, we're even on pretty hilly rides. However, if you're shelling out this much on a bike, then we think it should at least be light enough to impress anyone who picks it up at the cafe. The SL7 and V4RS win in this regard with frame weights of 800 and 798 grams respectively. The Dogma F is 865 grams unpainted, so not exactly a lot more, and it's actually the bike that surprised me the most. In our current getup, it weighs 6.9 kilos, so just over the UCI weight limit, which surprised me slightly given that it's got discs and, well, fairly chunky tube shapes. As the out and out aero bike, it comes as little surprise that the S5 is the heaviest of the four with a frame weight of 975 grams. The fork is also a fair bit heavier than its counterparts. And so high end builds will likely build up to about 7.5 kilos. For the vast majority of us, this minuscule difference in weights will have next to no effect in our performance, even on the hilliest of terrains. So it's probably best to ignore them unless you're going full weight weenie. You've probably heard by now that tires are getting wider. Most of the pros are on 28s and riders like me now often train on 30 mil tires. Some people even 32s. Tire clearance therefore is an important factor when considering a new bike, but it's unlikely to be the determining factor between these four. Compared to previous generations, all four have boosted tire clearance with the SL7 and V4 RS offering a claim capacity for 32 mil. The S5 up to a whopping 34 mil and the Dogma F still a perfectly respectable 28 mil. Realistically, you can still fit larger than those claim sizes in each. Plenty of people are reported running 32 mil tires on the Pinarello, for instance, with no rubbing. And so it's highly unlikely that you'll ever need to max out any of these frame clearances. 
Call me vain, but looks matter. And a large part of that comes down to paint. The SL7 is refreshed each year with a current choice of three 2023 frame set options with a further one more understated color weight for the full bikes. Let us know what you think of this rather garish paint job in the comments section below. The V4 RS is available in five colorways, including the men's and women's Team UAE and ADQ replicas. Although I think I'd be most tempted by this white one. With the S5, you're certainly limited with just two options. Cervelo has never been known for going out and out with its paint, but it's fair to say that the two choices are pretty swell. Swell? Sweet. The color options is an area where the Pinarello is the clear winner. Not only are there seven colorways to choose from, but the My Way section of the website allows you to customize your color scheme with up to 5,000 different combinations. You're therefore unlikely to see two the same in one, any one place, which to some riders will be invaluable. There's different graphic layouts, 27 different colors to choose from, and gloss or matte finishes. So, well, let us know what you think of my creation. Do you like it? All that customization does come at a pretty penny, 650 pounds in fact. But if you've just dropped five and a half K on a frame set, then suddenly that looks like pretty good value to have it look like no one else's. I'm guessing that you will want to know how they behave out on the road. Well, as you can imagine, they're all very nice bikes to ride. I reckon that the S5 feels the stiffest. It's a thoroughbred race bike that feels like a dying breed with the fastest handling, least compliant rear end, and obviously also the heaviest. It's everything an aero bike should be. And if I was contesting a Tour de France sprint, then this is the bike that I'd want to be on. However, it's the SL7 that's the bike I'd choose to ride an entire Grand Tour on, if I did indeed have to do a full three weeks on just one bike. Despite what manufacturers would have you believe, every bike is a compromise. It's impossible to have a bike that's aero, light, compliant yet stiff, but this S-Works frame for me manages to compromise the least and deliver in each of those areas. It's no wonder then that it's racked up quite so many wins on both sprint and mountain stages alike. The V4 RS in essence is a very similar bike to the Tarmac. It weighs all but the same, aims to do the same task and does indeed do it well. In our full review, which you can find over on the Road CC website, we gave it an eight out of 10. So it's a very capable bike, but we did pick up on the inherent stiffness, making it a less comfortable bike than, well, some of its other World Tour competitors. That can be forgiven if it's an out and out racer like the S5, but the slacker front end feels like an odd choice if that is what Carnago were going for. The Pinarello is a bike I'm torn on. The looks don't necessarily do it for me, but I respect the decision to stick to the brand's heritage. In the press release, Pinarello bang on about balance. And until I rode the bike, I dismissed this as meaningless PR talk. However, on the road, I do get it. Like any good road race bike, speed feels easy to come by, both on the flats and climbs. And the handling is just as suited to twisty town centre crits as it is hooning down a fast descent. It's a bike that you could race on, but you could also take it to an up for an ice cream. A hundred mile ice cream trip. Do you often do hundred mile ice cream trips? No, don't get the Pinarello then. In a world where road race bikes are looking more and more like each other, the Pinarello has somehow managed to look like nothing else on the market. And that does make it feel special. It's every bit the match of my tarmac. But I don't like the looks as much, so I'm sticking with the tarmac. The Colnago just doesn't quite do it for me. It feels more ordinary than the other bikes here. And that means that I'd be far more tempted to go for the C68 if I specifically wanted a Colnago to make me smile. The SL7 for me is still the all-round bike to beat. It's this that the V4S has tried to emulate, and yet despite being two and a half years old, it's still the SL7 that comes out on top, albeit marginally. The Cervelo S5 was the pleasant surprise of the bunch, I suppose. It's bloody fast. Perhaps even the fastest bike I've ridden. But would I choose it as a bike to ride every day of the week? No. In fact, all four bikes are actually quite hard to recommend for any mere mortal to buy. They're phenomenal race machines, but when it comes to buying advice, you can get 99% of the performance from bikes half of the price of any of these. These four bikes are likely gonna be responsible for a scary amount of Tour de France stage wins, but which one of them would be your first pick if money was no object? Let us know down in the comments section below, and if you like this video, then please give us a like and subscribe to the channel for more showdowns. We'll see you next time.